Witam Państwa w imieniu dziekana i całego zespołu dziekańskiego oraz oczywiście społeczności naukowej Wydziału Fizyki, w który, na którym to wydziale mamy dzisiaj przyjemność i zaszczyt Państwa gościć. Witamy się pewnie ostatni raz przed wakacjami przy okazji kolejnego wykładu ze znanej wszystkim już pewnie serii Zapytaj Fizyka. Temat dzisiejszego wykładu jest szczególnie aktualny, a właściwie zawsze aktualny, no bo tym tematem jest pytanie o istotę, o istotę czasu. Na to pytanie odpowiadać dzisiaj będzie pan profesor Carlo Rovelli, wybitny fizyk zajmujący się kwantową grawitacją i kwantową kosmologią, a przy okazji wielki przyjaciel naszego wydziału i bliski współpracownik naszych kolegów zajmujących się tą tematyką. Życzę Państwu przyjemnego wieczora, wielu wrażeń w towarzystwie pana profesora Rowellego. Może jeszcze powtórzę to samo w skrócie po angielsku dla tych z Państwa, którzy, którzy nie rozumieją czy nie znają jeszcze polskiego. Well, uh, uh, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Department of Physics of the University of Warsaw. It's uh, my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here on behalf of the Dean of the, of the department. The opportunity to meet tonight is the lecture, yet another lecture in the famous series of lectures entitled uh, Ask a Physicist. The topic of the lecture today is very timely and in a sense universal. It is the question of the origin of time. And the answer will be given by a distinguished physicist, Professor Carlo Rovelli, who is a great expert in the field of quantum gravity and quantum cosmology, and also, which is also important to us, a great friend of our department and a close collaborator of our colleagues who are working here in that, in that area. So I wish you again a pleasant evening. And well, our speaker has been already introduced, so I don't have to say that much more. Let me stress just in one sentence that he is one of the founders of the field which is called quantum gravity. And he is also a person engaged very much in science popularization. He wrote several books. The last one has the title Seven Brief Lessons on Physics. And as I heard, it was translated to more than 50 languages and already sold more than one million copies, so you can also contribute to this number and make it even greater. And we have a pleasure to welcome Professor Carlo Rovelli. Thank you. Dobre wieczór Państwu. Sorry, that's as far as my Polish goes, so I'll continue in English. Um, first, thank you very much for being here, all of you, and so, so numerous. Um, we start from that. Uh, these are two clocks, two watches, okay? And uh, uh, if I, they, they indicate the same time, Six, uh, four. So if I if I raise one, okay, I wait a little bit. One, two, three, four, and then I take it back and I compare them. Well, if they were better clocks than this one, these were not good enough. Um, what is mine? Sorry for to the person who lent this one to me. If they were good enough they would not indicate the same time. So let me repeat it. If I take two good clocks, I bring one of them up, I wait a little bit, and I come down, this one is gonna be late with respect to the other one. So up here, there's more time that passes than this one. This is a fact. Uh, today it's a, uh, we can measure this, not with clocks like that, which are not good enough because the difference is too small, but uh, uh, with good clocks. Uh, and it's not just a clock that goes uh, 
faster up here. It's a pendulum goes faster, flowers blossom faster, you have more time to think. You age more if you're up than down. So if two um, twin brothers go, uh, one stay in Warsaw and one go to uh, Zakopane in the mountains, we had some conferences in Zakopane, that's why you know Zakopane. When they meet again, the one that went in Zakopane is a little bit older than its twin brother. Um, again, this is a fact, it's not a theory, it's not it's something that can be checked. Today we have very good clocks, that's a very good clock, like, like this one, um, in some laboratories, uh, with which uh, one can check this difference of speed of time at few centimeters. So time goes faster here and slower here. Of course, it's very, very small uh, here on Earth, but somewhere else in the universe, the effect is, is, uh, is very large. Now, why I'm saying this? Because this indicates, it, 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 it's hard to believe at first, uh, but it's true, can be, can be checked, and it indicates that our intuition about time, it's not good enough. To, um, to make us understand easily everything about time. Time works differently than uh, our simple intuition. For instance, it goes faster up and slower down. And uh, this is only one of the many surprising uh, things that have been discovered uh, in the last, I would say, two centuries by physics, mostly, about time, and uh, which have opened a problem uh, about the nature of time. Time is different than we usually think, and uh, uh, what is it? How is it really? Uh, what is a good way of thinking about time at the light of everything we have, uh, we have learned? Uh, when we think about time, we, we tend to have a, a clear picture of what time is, right? I mean, we start at the six o'clock, for seven, we will have finished, and then this yesterday, the day before, tomorrow. Uh, time is like a common thing for everybody that passes the same, passes equal. Well, no. Time passes faster up and slower down. So time is more complicated, and uh, the more we study about it, the more we understand that um, our idea about time has a lot of layers. We assume about time this and this and this and this and this. Some things are true, some things are not true, some things we're not sure. Uh, time is complicated, it's a lot of layers. And uh, what I'm gonna do um, in this chat for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, I'm gonna do three things. The first thing, I'm gonna tell you what we have learned about these different layers of time. Which one we understand, which one we don't understand. Let me just, I've made here a, a, a list of aspects of time, which are all part of our idea about time, but they're all different stories somehow. I'm gonna open up this story a little bit. One, time flows, passes, right? I mean, time is going, I, sh I, I should not chat too much, I should tell you things because we have a finite amount of time and time passes. Second, um, Past is different from the future in a very funny way. The future seems to us fixed. We are full of traces of the future. We remember the future. We don't remember, oh, sorry. <laughs> we remember the past. We don't remember the future. We have books that talk about the past, uh, reliable. We have books that talk about the future, unreliable. Um, we have pictures of the past. Uh, I have pictures of myself young. I don't have pictures of myself old. You may think it's a silly system question, but why? Why the picture of myself in one direction of time, not in the other? You will see why this is an enormously interesting um, uh, question. So the past is different from the future. We have the idea that time is unique. Between one event and another event, there is two seconds. And I just told you that's not true. Because if you go up, there's more time between the same two events. Two brothers are born at the same moment. One go up, one come down, they meet again, the one who has gone up is older than the one who's come down. So already this is wrong, it's false. Um, 
We have the idea that uh, time is the same all over the universe. There's a present to the universe. Right now, here in Warsaw, something is happening, something important is happening, this lecture. Um, uh, elsewhere, other things are happening. In Rome, something is happening. In, in, in the galaxy of Andromeda, something is happening right now. I will tell you that that's, there's something wrong in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this story. And then we have the idea that everything evolves in time. Time is a sort of uh, uh, elementary passing things, and everything changed with, uh, uh, with time. And of course, I have the idea that uh, uh, things happen. And to happen, they have to be in time. Now, all these layers, I'm going to, most of them, throw them out of the window. And uh, at the end of this hour, uh, remain with very, very little of that. So, as I was saying, I'm going to do three things. The first time is to tell you what we have learned in the last uh, century and so, and most of what we have learned is that these layers are not true. Are not true in the sense that they're not fake, but they're approximations. Are not true all over the universe. Are not true at any precision. They are true only limited for us within an approximation from a perspective. Uh, um, and uh, when we throw away all the parts which are not true, when we get to a vision of time, an understanding of time, which has only what remains, this is the second part. I will tell you how a plausible picture of the world without the approximation may work, and it will be to some extent a timeless picture of the world. And then you will be very unhappy because you say, well, if, if at some elementary level there is this timeless picture of the world, what is this thing that we call time? Why do we have only 45 minutes and no more? So the third part, I will try to come back and tell you how the various layers of time are recovered within approximation in, particular, in a particular sense, in a particular. So that's the plan. Three steps. Uh, time loses its pieces, the world without time, and recovering layer by layer. Now, before starting, um, the first part, I'm going to tell you something that uh, we know. We know meaning all my colleagues agree. We might all be wrong, but that's a different story. Uh, the second part, I'm not going to tell you something that all my colleagues agree. I'm going to tell you something on which uh, a part of the physics community are, is working and on which not everybody agree. So I'm not just telling you something we have learned. We physicists have learned that the Earth is round. I'm going to tell you something that we have learned, but also some ideas on which physics is working, which I believe they're true, but I'm sure that inside this room there is somebody who does not believe it some of my colleagues. And the last part will be the more shaky because there was some speculation, some attempt to, uh, to come back to understand what is time for us. So uh, in this talk, there will be a solid part, an uncertain part, and a very shaky part, OK? But the beauty of science, I, for me at least, is this one. We are not talking about what we have clear, but we are talking about what we have clear, what we think we see, and what we think could be there, and we don't know yet. So let's go to the first part, time loses pieces. So the first thing I've told you <coughs> is this. Uh, time goes at different speed. Now, more precisely, uh, the more you go close to a mass, to the center of the Earth, the more time slows down. Um, if you have a planet which is much bigger or much more compact than the Earth, its effect is bigger. So if you go to Jupiter uh, and you go to the surface of Jupiter, which is liquid, so you have to swim, uh, the, the time goes even sl slower. Um, if you go next to a very compact star on the star, you burn, but if you don't burn, time goes even slower uh, there. That, um, as, as I said, that's something we measure already. Uh, what is really surprising is not that this happened, is that somebody understood this much before having good clocks for measuring it. And this person, of course, it's Albert Einstein. Um, Albert Einstein understood this uh, uh, a century ago 
in fact, 102, 103 years ago, just by thinking, or more precisely, by taking everything in physics that was well known at the time, the pieces of, it, of, of the knowledge of the world, which were known at the time, and uh, uh, finding um, difficulties in bringing them together, and finding a right way to making them co coherent. And he realized that to do that, he had to change some prejudice about time, including the prejudice that time is the same for everybody. So uh, not out of pure thinking, but uh, from the knowledge of the physical world available at the time, from what his own work, from the work of Newton, of Copernicus, of everybody else, of Maxwell, uh, by bringing together the pieces, essentially by trying to put together what Maxwell understood, and what Newton understood, what he himself understood, which was incoherent. He thought that uh, you could make it clear and provided that time is the same, not the same for everybody. So he wrote these papers and said, look, time is going to be um, faster up and slower down. People said, hmm, but it's true. Now we, we can measure this, uh, uh, this easily. So what does this mean? It means that uh, there is a single time Right? If, I, if I do this experiment or this um, experience with two clocks, is this clock which is accelerating with respect to the true time, which is this one, or is this clock which is late with respect to the true time, which is this one? That's a silly question. There's no true time. Each clock has its own time. Each phenomenon in the universe has its own time, and uh, uh, it's not just one time. There are sort of many times. Right? So the universe, you can think as uh, uh, every path in the universe, every, every story, every phenomenon, uh, has its own rate of passage of time. And time is just this network of times, plural, that pass together. And somewhere goes very, very slow. And as I said, the more slow you go, the more close to a mass you go, the more slow where the most, the most slow you, you, time passes. And in fact, um, one of the beautiful things of the last 10, five years in astronomy is that uh, uh, astronomers now see plenty of black holes in the sky. That's another discovery of Einstein, right? That there are black holes. Nobody believed it. Uh, Einstein did not believe that these things could actually exist. He died without thinking that they were actually real. Uh, but uh, they are real. There are plenty of black holes in the sky. And uh, uh, now we understand pretty well what happened to black holes, at least around the black hole and near. In the very center, we don't know. And near a black hole, this is an artistic picture of a black hole. It's a sort of region where, in a, in a small area inside, there's a huge something. And when you go to the border of this, to the boundary of this, time slows down enormously. So in fact, what we could do is jump to the future easily, it's just an issue of money, by taking a starship going near a black hole. There are many in the galaxies, many, many, many in the galaxies, very close to a black hole, and you turn the engine on, go away, and if we stay half an hour via the black hole near, we go away outside a century has passed. So we can easily jump a century ahead. It's come back with harder. Um, so it's a... There's not a single clock that uh, uh, ticks away the time of the universe. There are many clocks that dance together. And in fact, I can't resist. Uh, the, there's this conference here, which is going on in this uh, same uh, uh, room uh, during the day. Tomorrow will. Uh, but we are not as many. So during the day, this is, is a wall close here, and the conference goes on this part. And one of the things discussed in this uh, 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 conference, there was a, a, a long talk this morning. I also talked about something like that. It's a speculative idea. We're not sure. Is the possibility that black holes uh, could explode after some time. So at the very early universe, this is a universe expanding. You know the universe expands, right? So at the very early universe, the universe was small. Some black holes might have formed, have lasted for long, and now, boom, they, they explode. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because uh, if this is true, so this is a black hole forming and then expanding. Now, time goes at different speeds. So if you jump into the black hole, you're going to get squeezed horrendously. But if you resist the squeezing and come out, you come out after, say, a microsecond. 
So it's very fast. Pew, pew. But it's fast inside. Outside, so it's 10 billion years. So 10 billion, according to this model, 10 billion years outside correspond to a microsecond inside. You see the time is all out of the joints, as Shakespeare put it. So this is the, uh, the picture of the black holes. So that's one thing I wanted to tell you. So time is something that may go at incredibly different speed depending on who you are. And as the idea of a single time uh, doesn't fit with general relativity, with the theory that we know describe the world, world world. There are many times. Einstein gave us the, question, the equations that say how the different times relate to one another. So using Einstein equation, it's very easy to compute. I mean, this is one meter higher. For three seconds, I can compute the difference of the time. OK, so one thing we lost is the unicity of time, many times. Second thing, I'll mention three things. Second thing, uh, I'll just stay on this picture. Uh, this is something we lost even before. And uh, it's one of the most puzzling things in physics. Uh, this was understood uh, uh, not by Einstein, but before Einstein, so the previous generation. And it's the following story that maybe you have already encountered in, when you study physics. All the elementary equations that describe the world, the Newton equation, the Maxwell equation, uh, Schrodinger equation, all the equations, the general relativity, uh, the equation of quantum field theory, the basic equations that we believe describe the world, don't distinguish the past and the future. Everything that can happen in one direction of time can also happen in another direction of time. It's a fact. And we don't have any evidence that these equations are false. But we see plenty of things which happen in one direction and not in the other. If you take some cubes of ice and you put it there, after a while, they are just melted and there's some water here. Now, there's no way to put some water here and they pile up and make little cubes like that. It doesn't happen backwards. So this was studied uh, in the 19th century by people studying, um, sorry, in the, uh, the 19th century by uh, people studying heat and temperature, uh, Clausius, Boltzmann. And uh, it, this fact that something happened in one direction, not in the other direction, is captured in one single equation of physics, which is uh, called uh, um, the second principle of thermodynamics, the entropy grows. So there's a quantity that grows but does not decrease. It's a single equation that distinguish the past from the future. And there is heat. And if you think a moment, think how beautiful it is. All the phenomena that distinguish past from the future have heat, or, or something like heat. Like here, for instance, heat comes into the ice and melts it. If you have a pendulum uh, that keeps oscillating, and you make a movie and turn it backward, you see the same oscillation of the pendulum. No heat, it's invariant and they're coming back in time. But if you have a pendulum and you wait enough and then it slows down and it stops, you make a movie and you see that it doesn't make any sense because pendulum don't, don't start augmenting. And when it stops, why it stops? Because of friction that produces heat. So it's only heat that distinguishes the, the past from the future. But what is heat? Heat was understood still in the 19th century, mostly by Boltzmann, Maxwell. Boltzmann is the hero of this story. To be the fast motion of the molecules. The difference between ice and water is that the molecules of water move much faster than in ice, so they are blocked like that. So heat is something that has to do with the fact that there are many, many molecules. And we're giving a description collective of all these molecules together in terms of macroscopic variables. This is mind-blowing. If you describe the details of motion of all the molecules, the past and the future are the same. But in terms of a macroscopic description, the past is different from the future. 
is something very mysterious here, and I think it's something we have not yet understood. Now, we do understand why things melt, because um, um, uh, heat goes from hot stuff to cold stuff, and uh, mixes everything up. But why in the past things were not mixed up? The entropy grows. We understand why entropy grows. But why in the past entropy decreases? It's a mystery. I'm going to come back to that. Um, and as far as time is concerned, there are some aspects of time which disappear if you look at the detail and are there if you look at macroscopic variables. So it seems that time is not something out there. It's something in the description. Mystery. Third mystery, and then I close the first part of this, uh, uh, this destructive part of my, of my presentation. And uh, uh, th this is probably the most incredible story of modern physics, in my opinion. So uh, we all know what is a present, right? Now is happening something, and at this very same moment, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you, we know this is a present. So we have a very clear idea of the present. Now, think a moment. You look at me, but the, this means that light goes from me to you. But light, to travel from here to there, takes a little bit of time. So, um, this is me lecturing there, this is you sitting there, lights take some time. So this is the future, this is the past. Okay, if I look at you, okay, no, this is me looking at you. If you look at me, it's the same thing reversed. Light goes from me to you. So between you looking at me and me looking at you, there is a little discrepancy of, of time. It's very short. I mean, there's a few nanoseconds, a few meters. So nanoseconds, we don't perceive nanoseconds. If I call somebody in New York, it's milliseconds time to go back and forth. We don't perceive milliseconds. But if I'm talking with somebody on Mars, we all know because, well, you know, I mean, uh, when I was young, people used to travel in space. They don't do it anymore. Uh, but when they were against these guys on the moon, uh, there was a few seconds between is it a, a, a message and coming back. Um, so, given a point, me here, uh, I can see what is beyond, before, in the, before this time. Uh, everybody who can see me is after this time. In between, there is some time interval, which is some nanosecond here, which is some millisecond here, some years there, some millions of years on Andromeda, um, where we cannot communicate in between. The communication cannot be faster than that. Well, you can say, well, so what? I mean, the present is just halfway between this point and this point. The present for me is just halfway between what you see me and when, you, when I see you and when you will see me. Well, it turns out that it doesn't work. I don't want to bore you to go into detail, but it turns out that if you think that the present is just halfway here, and in the meanwhile, you're traveling at some speed and you think that your present might that your present is halfway between your past and your future, they think don't match. So the result of this story is that there is no point here which is really present for this one. The result of this story is that in the large universe, it makes no sense to say that some thing that happened here or here or here is contemporary to this one. So in other words, our idea of present, it's an approximation because uh, these two lines are very, very squeezed. The present is just the fact that this is, is, is what is between the upper line and the lower line. And since we don't distinguish small time intervals, we see it just as a moment. But there's nothing like that in the universe. In the universe, in the vast universe, uh, there are events which are in our future, we can send a message to them. There are events which in our past, we can see them. And in between, there is vast, vast, vast amount of time 
millions of years on, the, on the distant galaxies, which are neither future nor past, and none of this is more present than the other. So the idea that we can think of the entire universe as the present is just wrong. And if you think, if you study general relativity, if you study cosmology, if you study, it becomes more and more clear that the present is a wrong idea. It doesn't describe the world. This is mind blowing because uh, it's a foundation of our idea of reality. Reality exists in the present, but there's no present in the universe. So what is reality? Okay, I hope I've succeeded to confuse you enough. Uh, and uh, that was the easy part. That is the part that we do understand. So the first thing I told you is a basic effect in general relativity, Einstein theory. This thing I told you is a basic effect in special relativity, early Einstein theory. And the fact that in the elementary equation of the, of the world there's no distinction between the past and the future is something that was realized before in the 19th century and every physicist know very well. Now, how do you bring together a picture of all that? Let me make a jump. I jumped all the way to the 60s, still 50 years ago, when uh, uh, two physicists, two American physicists, wrote an equation that is supposed to bring together, every, in, in a coherent manner, Einstein theory about the different times with quantum mechanics. And these two uh, physicists, is, uh, um, the name is, uh, uh, John Wheeler and Bryce David. Here they are. And they wrote, write an they wrote an equation, which is that equation there. I'm not explaining you the equation in any sense. But I want to write this equation because this equation has a feature that there's no variable t in it. And uh, for decades, um, there have been conferences and discussions and papers uh, saying, uh, how can an equation without a time variable can have anything to do with our experience of the world where there is time? And uh, uh, after this long discussion, I think things are now clarified. And uh, there is a not universal, but large consensus that perhaps not this equation, but something like that can very well describe our world without time. So there is a way of thinking the world in which there is no unique time, there is no time at all. You talk about something else. And, uh, um, this is the set of equations in which I am working. That's the basic equation of loop quantum gravity. Loop quantum gravity was mentioned at the beginning in the introduction. Again, I'm not going into uh, describing what they are, what they mean, but the key point is there's no time there, there's no t. So how can you have a description of the world without time if physics is how things change in time? Well, it's easy. And the solution is incredibly simple. Uh, in this picture. So uh, time, we measure time with clocks, right? Clocks, the basic clocks is a pendulum. And in fact, most clocks are pendular. Even these clocks here, there is a quartz, there, a little crystal that oscillates, or some electronic that oscillates. Um, the guy who realized that clocks can be used to make, um, that pendula can be used to make clocks is Galileo. And there's a story, which is probably fake, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story that every, every student here, that Galileo, Galilei was in Pisa um, during a religious ceremony, a mass, and sitting in the church in the cathedral of Pisa, and he was probably not paying much attention to the uh, mass. And there was the, uh, how do you say it in English, chandelier with all the candles uh, that was slowly oscillating, and he was looking at it, and he noticed that as, as the oscillations became uh, smaller and smaller because of friction, the time it took, each oscillation was the same. And he realized, this thing that we studied at school, maybe you remember, that the oscillation of a pendulum are all the same, or is oculus, are all the same time. Now the way, uh, the story is told by one of his, uh, students in, uh, in, in his memories. And the way Galileo is said to have uh, discovered this is measure the time by measuring his pulse. So each oscillation, he was counting how many pulls of his uh, heart uh, there were. And he was realizing that the oscillation was smaller and smaller, but it's always the same number of pulses. 
Well, first, he didn't get excited because otherwise, he, you know, pools would go faster. <laughs> um, but apart from that, if you think for a moment, that's it's total nonsense. Because nowadays, a doctor, this is me drawing, sorry for this horrible drawing, a doctor measures the pulse of a patient using a clock, which is a pendulum. So we measure the pulse with a clock, which is a pendulum, which have the same, takes the same time because uh, the pulse of Galileo, it's totally circle. Are, are all we measuring our pulse thanks to the pulse of Galileo? I mean, what is, what is going on here? There's something totally circular here. Well, what is going on was completely clarified, in fact, a generation later by Newton. In the beginning of his book, he makes it totally clear. And Newton says very clearly, we don't measure time. We only measure things that change, penduli and uh, clocks and, uh, and pulses and things like that. But it's very convenient to, that's exactly what Newton say, to imagine that there is a variable t and ha describe everything changing with respect to t, even if we never see t. We only see things that change in t. So a clock is something that whose, uh, the angle between the 12 and, and, and the handle changes with time. But you don't see the changing of time. You see how something else changed with respect to the angle. So Newton says it's very convenient, convenient to add this variable t to describe how the various variables the pulse, the clock, the oscillation, this and that, the moon, the sun, uh, the electric field, the quarks, whatever, change with respect to one another. But what we see is a change with respect to one another, not the change with respect to time, which is invisible. So in physics, what we describe is how variables change with respect to one another. Now, Newton is very smart, and Galileo and so on, to say, well, let's use clocks as a preferred reference for measuring everything else. But that may be convenient, but might not work in the vast world and when there's quantum and generativity and everything else. So that's the meaning of the wheeler dewitt equation. I go back to the wheeler dewitt equation. It does not describe how things change with, with respect to time. It just describes how things change with respect to one another. Why? Because it's talking about a very, very small quantum gravitational thing, quantum space-time, everything is jumping around. There's not just time, common time for everything. Physics can be expressed, and that's the wheeler dewitt equation, that's loop quantum gravity, that's the story here, not in terms of uh, changing of variables in time, but of changing of variables with respect to one another. Relations between variables expressed by the dynamical equations. So instead of saying, this is my equation for a pendulum, how it changes time, you can say, this is my pendulum, this is my clock, I have two variables, and this is my equation that says how two variables change with respect to one another. If you do that, you stop thinking about time, you just start thinking about relative relations between things that we measure. And let me, how am I doing with time? because time exists for us. Um, let me just uh, flash this transparency here, because I like it. This is the world according to theoretical physics. The last line is hypothetical, is what I think. But until the last line is what has happened. In, this is a what exists, according if you ask the physicists, which is different than what exists if you ask the philosophers, the biologists, the poets, uh, somebody in love, and so on. Um, and there was time for a while until uh, there was this funny mixture of space and time which uh, Einstein gave us, which is called space-time. But then space-time turned out to be one of the many fields of the world. And uh, if we mix it with quantum, mechanical, with quantum mechanics, uh, this space-time is just one of the jumping thing around. So there's not anymore an external time in terms of which you define things. You have just things happening one with respect to another one. This is uh, the world uh, at short scale. And I'm going to skip this. Um, um, so 
sorry, because uh, I want to go faster. I just show you the the last image, which is how the world look at the quantum gravity scale. So very different from our uh, picture. You see, um, in quantum gravity, which is the theory on which we are, I'm working and many of my colleagues are working, um, the notion of time disappears because this relation between happening between different variables. The notion of space disappears because space is a, a excitation of quantum gravitational field. The notion of thing disappears because it's just happening of things and so on and so forth. Uh, thinking about time down there um, is useless, in my opinion. And again, this is the opinion of a part of the physics community, not all the physics community. I repeat, the fundamental equation of the world, if you want to write them down, forget about time. You list the things you can measure, and you have relations to measurables, and that's physics. Good. So now that we are in deep spaces, we have to come back. Because from this crazy quantum gravitational picture of the world when there is no time, we have to recover time. But we don't recover time just in one step, because by time we mean all sorts of different things. We mean a, uh, a, prefer, a choice of a variable with respect to which use all the others, others to to label the variation of all the other. I choose my clock time, which is a good, my handle, the position of my handle, because it's a good position with respect to which I can evolve the rest. But also a preferred time, a unique time, and so on and so forth. So how do we recover time? We have to recover time uh, step by step. And part of it is exactly the slice that I gave you before, uh, we can go back. This theory is, uh, of which I've tol told you, where there is no time at all, is quantum gravity. It should have a regime, an approximation, in which I can disregard quantum mechanics, and I get back to Einstein theory. And in Einstein theory, there are all these times. The time of one clock, the time of the other clock, and I have equations that tell me how they are related. And uh, if I go down to uh, special relativity, uh, I have uh, not a global time, but some special times, which are the ones special relativity. If, 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 uh, if I have an approximation which the speed of line, I consider them infinite, then my, my, my extended pre present collapses down to one. So of all the possible presence is one which is preferred. And so I get to a, to a global time. So the more I put myself in a specific corner of the world with some approximation hold, the, the more I recover pieces of time. What I don't recover easily is the time is a different from past from future. Where does the different from past from future come from? Where, why, if, if physics is relation between variables, why if one variable is different than the others? I hope I've convinced you that we, time is just one variable among the, all the others. But it's not. Because I, can, I cannot go back in time. Why I cannot go back in time? What, what makes that particular variable special with respect to the others? If with Galileo, we realize that in Newton, we realize that physics is about relations between variables. Why a clock is a special variable? I think, and now we're going in more and more uncertain terrain. I'm not telling you we physicists know that. I'm telling you I, Carlo, think that, which is a much weaker statement. I think that um, to start understanding that, one has to go to thermodynamics, to heat. It's only when there is heat that the future and the past start to be different. But what is heat? Um, as I told you, heat, temperature, are notions that describe collectively a large number of small things. A large number of small things can be described collectively in many ways. 
a priori. Some ways are such that you get entropy that grows. You get a uh, special variables with respect to which we see the phenomena that we call time. It's only when there is this averaging between many variables that the phenomena that we most characteristically call temporal, or temporal start emerging. So we have to look into thermodynamic, into collective motion, not just about in mechanics, in fundamental physics, uh, to understand what happens. And here is something very remarkable. If I interact with something with many degrees of freedom, I am a physical system. I'm not, I don't believe in ghosts and soul and stuff like that. I'm a piece of the world. I'm a physical system. I interact with something. Okay? I interact through some variable, a few. These few variables allow me to give an approximate description of the system. With respect to me, with respect to this interaction, there is a thermodynamical description of that system. So that's me. That in the flow of time, there is something perspectival, something that regards me. Now you can say, wait a minute, how can it be that something so common, like the flow of time, can be perspectival? Uh, well, there was a Polish guy called Copernicus who um, understood uh, why the sky turns around us. For centuries, humanity has seen the sky turning around us. And the sun goes up and goes down. The moon goes up and goes down. The stars goes up and go down. It's the most visible, global, immense, spectacular, beautiful show of the cosmos. Why it does so? Well, we understand perfectly why it does so. But in a remarkable way, it's not the cosmos that turns. It's us turning. Right? The turning of the sky is not a fake thing, it's a real thing, but it doesn't concern the sky. It concerns the relation between us and the sky. We are turning, and so we see the sky turn. So to understand why the sky turn, it's a good question. It's a very good, it turned out to be a fantastic question in astronomy and physics. The answer is to look at yourself. Look how your, your planet is moving, not how the sky is moving. So I think that to, to understand this characteristic feature of time, we have to look at ourselves, not at the universe at large. Ourself meaning at the relation of us as physical system with respect to the, to the, to, uh, uh, to the rest. So I don't want to go into detail, uh, but I think, I suspect um, that if you want to understand the sense of flowing time that we have, and why the past is different from the future, we have to understand which one are the specific features of the coupling between the system in which we belong, as physical subsystem, and the rest of the universe. A little bit like the Earth that uh, toured. Now I want to make the last step, because, uh, all right, uh, suppose there is something in this coupling, and I do have some mathematics that makes this a little bit more precise, which, on which I'm not going to go into it, uh, but suppose this is the case, but why times flow? Why do we see time flow? Why do we remember the past and not the future? Well, if we can remember something, it's because entropy grows. The reason there are traces of the past is because entropy was, was low in the past. Nothing else, because there's nothing else in the world that describes the past or the future. But entropy grows, we are in a coupling with the rest of the world such that the past was special. And because the past was special, there are traces. And since there are traces, there are memory. And our brain uses memory heavily. In fact, I think if we want to understand why time passes, to a large extent, we don't have to ask the physicists, we have to ask the people who study the brain. If you ask the people who study the brain, there's a huge amount of brain research recently. There's a book, for instance, um, that came out recently. The title is Your Brain is a Time Machine. I think it's a beautiful title. 
um, there is a large body of work on the brain that tries to understand the brain as a system which couples to the traces of the past and works to predict the future. So in the set of the event of happening in the world, which by itself is not time ordered, our brain is capable of using the past law entropy for um, computing what is going to happen in the future. Is that what happens, what opens for us, I believe, the space which is our sense of the flowing time? That's what we have to look at. Am I sure? No, I'm not sure at all. But it seems to me that there is something which is not directly into physics. This flowing time, this... We have the sense, right? The, the past goes up to some where we remember. And this is very related to our identity. We are that passing time. And let me add one, one, one piece of... Um, time is not... Uh, amorphous for us. Time is important for us. We are not uh, relating to time in a non-emotional way. We are always relating to time in an emotional way. There is a comment, um, um, you know, modern philosophy is sort of broken in two parts. There is an analytic Anglo-Saxon part uh, and there is a continental uh, uh, German, French, whatever part, uh, and it's two worlds that don't talk to one another. But of course, both parts, the, both philosophers talk about time a lot. And the greatest book about time in the analytic um, is by Reichenbach. And uh, the greatest book about time um, in the continental is probably um, uh, Heidegger. And if you read the two books, they, the two make the same observation at the beginning. The observation is uh, the following. Look at all the philosophies of the past and what they say about time. And a lot of them try to deny time. Plato, a world of ideas. Hegel, a uh, spirit that jumps out of time by realizing it's itself. Parmenides, that there's no time at all, and so on and so forth. Other philosophies, uh, just think in terms of time. You know, um, uh, Heraclitus, uh, Bergson, and so on. And both Reichenbach and uh, Heidegger suggest that the source of this philosophy is the emotional reaction that we have about time. Why? Because for us, time is losing thing, right? Time is what opens us life, but also what takes away life. In Buddhism, life is pain because it's, why is pain? Because we lose what we have. We cannot avoid losing what we have. So this is an emotional reaction to time. And so both Reichenberg and, and Heidegger, which is as different philosophers you can imagine, they both suggest that uh, the actual source of the philosophy of time is our emotional relation with respect to time. There's a part of us that want to deny time and part of us that grasp to time because we are time, in a sense. Now, I think this is very true. I think, and this I'm going obviously extraordinarily far away from my work as a physicist, but I do it nevertheless. Um, I think that... When we try to understand what is time, a long tradition tells us to say, well, try to put away your emotions to understand what time really is. But I think that to a large extent, time is our emotion about time. Time is an emotional fact for us. It's this thing that passes. We are, in our brain, uh, machines that opens up the space of time by using past traces to predict the future, and we are very aware because of, you know, this, you know we are uh, primates that had this big explosion of a million years ago for our brain, so we, we can think about the future. We're very good to think about the future. We know we're going to die. So time is, ends for us, and we have a, an emotional reaction to that. Emotional reaction is crucial to the very way we think, uh, we think about time. And do I have clear ideas about that? No, of course. But I do think that time is this multi-layered thing, part of which has to do with pure physics, part of this has to do with thermodynamics, part of this has to do with quantum gravity. Many, at many levels, there are things we don't understand. We don't understand why entropy was low in the past. We don't understand why, if it is true that I can write equations without time, 
Um, we don't understand how do we get this sense of flowing time. But I do understand that all the various pieces have to go together, and there's a big effort in trying to understand uh, um, all of them. A um, couple of slides. There is one. Uh, um, I like Proust in all this story, because Proust has written this uh, marvelous novel, uh, to, uh, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, uh, Searching for Pastime, I don't know the English title, um, which, if you think for a moment, if you have read it, is not, it's the 5,000 pages of novel, is not a story happening in time. It's an entire story about the memory of the main character, sort of Marcel. It's all happening here. So for plus time is in the head. It's all memory time. And there's one line, this is in the second, third book, the Le Jeune Fille en Fleur. Uh, we know that the earth turns, and, uh, uh, but we do not pay attention. The ground on which we walk does not appear to move, uh, and uh, uh, we live in peace, ignoring. Okay? And then he says, so it is time in our life. There's all this um, going on, and I think it's, it's nice because uh, there is a similarity with the rotation of the earth uh, in, in the way I've said uh, uh, before. And the other slide that I can resist uh, um, presenting is this one. Um, because uh, which illustrate how through the centuries our uh, thinking about time has uh, changed. These are two, uh, how do you say in English, um, the thing to measure time with the, with the shadow of, uh, of the sun. Sundial, thank you. Two sundials in the same church is the Cathedral of Strasbourg. Uh, one is from the late Middle Ages, one is the beginning of the uh, Renaissance. So it's a couple of centuries between the two. And one is a sundial uh, held by an angel. And 200 years later is a sundial held by a mathematician. So time has gone from the hands of the angels to the hands of the mathematicians. Perhaps we should make another one in which there's just a man or a woman holding it. And there's, uh, uh, because I think time is largely something of uh, uh, humans more than in the, in, the, in the system itself. All right. So uh, he, this was my list of layers. And uh, um, let me uh, just tell you what I think. Uh, which one of these aspect of times remain at the basic level of nature as we understand today? Well, as we think, we, uh, as we try to understand today. Um, the world is made by happenings, by things that happen for a short time, not for a long time. It's not by things. Okay? The world is not made by stones that remain there. The world is made by kisses. Uh, so that minimal aspect of temporality is in our current understanding of the world, whatever we do. But the idea that all this happening uh, are ordered in a time variable, we can get rid of it and just say how they happen one respect to the other. The idea that there's a unique time all over the universe is definitely wrong. We have learned it with generativity Einstein theory. Um, the idea that uh, even here, locally, there is a unique time is definitely wrong. I told you. I mean, it's just two clock. There's no sense in which one is more time than the other. It's like asking whether slotis are more, the value of slotis of euro is more important than the value of euro in slotis. It only sense with respect to one another. Uh, the fact that past is different from the future, it's only true in the context of this limited information is, is, is coded in the lack of information that I have when I uh, average over many quantities in a way which we understand only partially, I, uh, I believe. Um, the fact that we have traces of the past and not in the future is only a consequence of uh, uh, low entropy in the future. So it's only a consequence of the dynamics. And I think the sense of flowing uh, time that is so crucial for us, which is emotional more than else, uh, has to be understood uh, by studying our brain and not by studying uh, physics. So of this time um, things measured by clock, uh, there's quite a little bit that uh, remains. Uh, but nevertheless, within our life, we are within all these approximations. So for us, obviously, time is real, very real. My time is over. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Do we still have some time? Yeah, uh, please um, okay, welcome so comments, uh, we can, questions. Uh, we can as, pause as much time, as you want. So we still have some of that. So does anyone have some question? There is a question. Okay. You mentioned about uh, one arrow of time. This is a thermo thermodynamic arrow of time. But you have two more. One is a cosmological arrow of time. We know that our galaxy, our universe is expanding. And the third one is a, a PC symmetry breaking on the fundamental level of elementary particles, which we know happens. And what is your opinion about these three arrows of time? They are consistent, all of three or not? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the answer is different in the two cases that you said, uh, as far as I understand. Namely, uh, for what concerns the violation of T invariance in fundamental physics, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's a confusing way of putting things. What the universe, as far as we have seen so far, is invariant under is CPT. It's not T. So when we say um, fundamental physics is time inversely invariant, we are actually saying is CPT invariant. So it is it, it's in an issue of name. We should have called the CPT T, and, and then we wouldn't have fell into this trap. For instance, just take electromagnetism. It's not true that if you take electric magnetic field evolved ahead and back in time, they equally solve the mass cause equation. You have to flip the magnetic field. But we give this for granted. I mean, the magnetic field is something that flips. Uh, there is a parity thing that goes together with, uh, uh, with uh, going back in time. So that's an issue of defining things properly. Contrary to that, the fact that the cosmological expansion which defines an arrow of time, um, goes together with increase of entropy. Uh, it's a definite fact about the world, which we see, observe, which surprises us, and in my opinion, we don't understand. So it's one of the open questions uh, uh, to which I don't see us having a good answer. So it's part of the general question why the entropy was low in the past. It's an aspect of the dynamics we don't understand. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a piece of the puzzle. There's one in front first. Uh, okay. Uh, in front. I, I'm here. There is a microphone. Oh, sorry. I, uh, uh, I just would like to know more uh, about uh, uh, the symmetry between past and future and the implications for free will. Uh, because basically we can say that we have free will because the future is still open, so the decision that we make in the past influence the future. So to make an example, yesterday I asked my wife uh, if she wanted to attend uh, uh, your lecture. She agreed, so now we are here, but we, we think that she, she might have said no, and that would have changed the fact that we are here today. So in your view of time and or your view of symmetry of time, how can we explain the impression that we have the free will and we can choose whether yeah, attend yeah, your lesson or not? Yeah, clear. So um, first of all, um, I, I, I thank your wife. <laughs> um, second, uh, this is an immensely debated issue uh, in physics, but much more in philo not much in physics, but a lot in philosophy and in different on different grounds. So I certainly don't give you an answer which convince anybody. I just can tell you what I think about. Um, I think the solution. My own take on that is that the solution is simple. It's not complicated. It's written in the book of Spinoza centuries ago in the Ethic, in the last chapter of the Ethic. Namely, um, we do have uh, a. Uh, picture, uh, our brain forms an image of the outside world, our brain forms an image of uh, the other people's images and an image of ourselves. We ourselves are enormously much more complicated than what our picture of ourselves allows. This means that we are largely unpredictable 
for ourselves. And that is what we call free will. It's compat called compatibilism, if you want, is not that free will is an illusion because we are truly unpredictable to ourselves uh, at, all, at all levels. There's a, the, the issue doesn't change in classical and quantum mechanics. It's just totally irrelevant for this discussion, in my opinion. Um, I don't see any contradiction. Suppose I forget quantum mechanics, which is irrelevant for that. Is I don't see any contradiction between a deterministic uh, uh, fundamental laws uh, and the fact uh, that in our uh, way of making sense of the world around us, uh, we use consistently a notion of free will. Okay, there is another question. Uh, my question is also related to the difference between future and past, but uh, it points from a different uh, direction. Well, actually, direction of Roger Penrose, because in his book he uh, said that there is a fundamental difference uh, even uh, operator when we uh, when there is the wave function and uh, it has it can choose between let's say two states and it it collapses and then it is not related to thermodynamics yes because if I have a known photon which just passes through uh, polarizer yes there is no dissipation of the energy but after the passing of the polarizer yeah. I have known photon. And uh, then it is only one way, uh, one way for, for the photon. You cannot uh, right. I, I make a, uh, an, the inverse um, uh, operator. So my question is uh, about your statement that the, the time is related only to thermodynamics. Maybe it's uh, also related somehow with uh, fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah, I know that that. I know where the, the part with Roger Pe the, 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 the I know where Roger Perez discusses this and makes this point. And uh, um, it's a subtle point about quantum mechanics. I'm going to stick my neck out a bit courageously and say that I believe he's wrong there. And I make a precise statement. Um, if I think about quantum mechanics, uh, uh, not in terms of questions like what is exactly the wave function doing and I forget collapse or anything like that. If I take a, a, a neutral uh, picture of quantum mechanics in which I have a quantum system, I make a series of measurements. I make a series of measurements of the, on the same system, okay? Repeatedly, many times. I list all the outcomes. Of course, these outcomes are related by probabilistic relations between them which I can compute. I give all these results to you, and I ask you, can you s tell me if these were measured in this direction, this direction, if time was in this direction, this direction? My claim is you cannot answer. So in other words, uh, there is a precise sense in which quantum mechanics is exactly as time reversal invariant as classical mechanics. Um, I think... I know. Um, well, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a paper in which I discuss exactly Penrose's argument on that. If you want, we can <laughs> at some point sit down and do it in detail. And I even might say that Roger could agree in a, uh, on, on this particular issue if in the details. Roger Penrose has, has, has another idea uh, which somehow the fact that entropy was low in the past, uh, that he has been one of the people who has pointed it out, how this is an open question, could be related to some law of nature that we don't yet know, uh, or to some happening at the Big Bang that we don't even know. This is a different story. So I try to come up with a different idea uh, on the origin of this uh, low past entropy. Uh, you, you mentioned about uh, our pre about brain, about our perception of time, and um, I wanted to ask about uh, the fact that uh, basically uh, older people actually uh, pre uh, for older people time is uh, going faster, right? Is is that because of uh, their brain actually the the uh, clock in their brain actually pendulum is is running slower? Can you comment on that? 
Yes, I can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, there's even some, some psychologists who are trying to measure this uh, fastening of time with, uh, with age and, and relate it to various, uh, to various possible interpretations. I think that the, the point here, uh, in a sense, is reverse. Namely, we all know that our perception of time goes faster and, and, and or, you know, when, when you're bored, time is longer when, and so on and so forth. When you're old, time is faster and so on and so forth. The point is that uh, we learned at school that this is true, but this regards our psychological perception of time. But behind that, there is a well clear physical time, which is the same for everybody. It's measured by clock. That's the real true time that Newton told us is the, one of the fundamental structures of the world. And it's not true. Because the physical time itself becomes longer and shorter, depending you move, you don't move, you're up, you're down. The story is much more complicated that uh, we have perceptions, but behind that there is a non-elastic time, if you want. This does not mean, of course, that uh, I'm old and time for me goes faster than uh, you're young, time for me goes longer. Uh, this does not mean that, that the general relativistic dilation of time is related to that. It's not. They're two diff totally different phenomena, in my opinion. I'm pretty convinced of that. There's one on the left or right, depending. Thank you for the lecture. <laughs> I wonder what's your opinion on Julian Barber, my, who is, in my opinion, the, the greatest living philosopher of physics, applied to physics. Uh, your your, your, your uh, observations about Galileo and circular definitions of time seem very similar to some, some, idea, some ideas of, of Julian Barber. You, 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 could, you must have met, yeah. you could have collaborated. Yeah, I know him very well, yeah. Uh, yes, of course, I, I was here with him last week in, uh, in Oxford. Um, it's, it's bad manners to ask somebody publicly what to think about somebody else. Uh, <laughs> so let me answer politely. Um, Julian, before doing his physics and his philosophy, has written a book, which is The History of Dynamics, which is a big book about uh, the evolution of physics from uh, Aristotle to uh, Newton, and how our dynamic, which in my opinion, it's one of the greatest book of history of physics ever written. I've been strongly influenced. It is a fantastic book. Uh, it's a unique book because not many people know history and know physics at the same time so well as Julian. Having said so, I think he would have done much better stopping there. <laughs> Sorry, Julian. <laughs> Well, it does not seem that there are more questions, or maybe one more, so maybe the last one here in, in the middle. Uh, thank you. Uh, I didn't understand... Uh, Can you cut one... the part of June? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I didn't understand one thing, if you can clarify it. Uh, you write uh, on the screen that uh, the time flow uh, has a uh, psychological basis. It's only our perception. But the difference between the uh, past and the future uh, is connected to thermodynamics. Isn't a difference between a past and a future a time flow? Uh, uh. Again, uh, time has layers. So um, I think that the psychological sense of time flow is certainly anchored in the fact that we have memory of the past and we don't have memory of the future. That's why the past is fixed. We, we feel the past fixed and we feel the future open even if that physics tell us that given the present state, we have equal information about the future and the past. Something else tells us that we have more information about the future. That's thermodynamic. That's low past entropy. So uh, if by time flowing you mean only the fact that the future is different from the past, uh, certainly uh, 
if we have a story about why entropy grows, we're, we're done. We're, we're fine. Why entropy not grows? Why entropy was low in the past? We're done, certainly. Uh, if you say why this implies that we have the sense that now is now and tomorrow we don't know, uh, this very strong sense of passing time, one could argue, and many people do argue, in fact, many, many people do argue, an entire school of philosophy does argue, that is not captured by physics, including entropy. And I think that it's hard to resist their argument. They do have strong arguments. But the answer to this argument is not that there is something missing in physics by itself, is that uh, you have to look for that particular physical system which our brain to get to, to that particular feeling. I don't know if this is a well, so uh, I'd like to say two things. One is that not only time is relative, but also the notion of the last is relative, because in fact we will have one more question, which will be the last one. And uh, it was also mentioned that this week we have a conference here about uh, quantum gravity. The organizer of this conference is Professor Lewandowski, and he has a question to Professor Rovelli. So what do you think about Kurt Vonnegut's theory? About, about Kurt Vonnegut's theory of time? presented in Slaughterhouse number five. I think that the good answer was given in a book written by John von Stottenburg in, in uh, uh, 19, 2014, isn't it? I have no idea what is this, uh, what is, what is this uh, theory? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so with this question and this answer, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.